It's really great to be here in, in San Diego, uh, where there have been so many wonderful celebrations uh, uh, celebrating uh, the life of Cesar Chavez. Pasen para acá, para adelante, hay asientos. As I've been going around uh, the state, you know, it's, so there have been so many celebrations for Cesar Chavez, and of course, I have to tell you that the one in San Diego. I believe was the biggest of all. I'm not talking about the marches, but uh, just in terms of the breakfasts and the dinners. And I understand that in San Diego, uh, you had a breakfast uh, organized by Carlos and, and Linda Legrete, uh, who are here from your community. Stand up, you two guys, so they can see you. <laughs> that had nearly 2,000 people in it, huh? How about that? Okay, so you guys take the prize. Uh, you really take the prize uh, for, uh, you know, honoring Cesar. And of course, uh, this would have been Caesar's 75th birthday had he lived. At the same time, uh, we're also celebrating the 40th anniversary of the United Farm Workers uh, we, when we started that union way back in 1962 and also the second year of the Cesar Chavez holiday, right? And as I said, there have been celebrations all over the country, uh, you know, all the way from San Antonio, New York City, uh, every place you can imagine there have been commemorations. But rather interesting uh, that the one city uh, which still will not name a school or a street for Cesar, they have a little park, right, is Delano, California, right? <laughs> Or Fresno, also, Fresno, California, uh, because there we see that the, that the growers, uh, the power of the growers is, is still very strong. And it's kind of uh, idiotic when you think about it. Uh, this is also the celebration of uh, the 100 years of John Steinbeck's birthday. And uh, throughout the state of California, they're having commemorations. John Steinbeck is the man who wrote the book, The Grapes of Wrath. And this was a story, I think most people know this, uh, but for those that maybe are here that don't know, this is a story about the people that came in uh, from the south, from, uh, from the southwest, from Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, places like Missouri. Many of the people who lost their farms and they came into California uh, looking for work in the fields. And uh, when it's interesting that when John Steinbeck wrote that book, uh, in Bakersfield, Kern County, that's where Delano was at, by the way, in, Ker in Kern County, that county banned the book, The Grapes of Wrath. They would not let them put that book in the library. In fact, there's some stories say that there might have even been a book burning of The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, so here's the story about these farm workers that came uh, in to try to make a better life. Their story was not being told. Of course, there was a movie that was made, of course, of The Grapes of Wrath, uh, which starred Henry Fonda, and which you can still see, it's still being played, you know, uh, today, The Grapes of Wrath. But they banned the book in Kern County, and now, of course, that book is in every library, right? Probably throughout the whole world. Uh, and, uh, but of course, those people that came from, uh, uh, from Arkansas and Oklahoma and those places, they were, the family was called the Jode family. Well, of course, that isn't the Jodes now today. Instead of the Jodes, they're the Lopezes and the Garcias and uh, all of these Latino names. And here we have farm workers who, you know, this is what, 60 years later, that are still kind of going uh, through the same uh, kind of misery, uh, the same kind of suffering uh, that, the, that the Jode family went through. So while in some instances a lot has, you know, improved for farm workers, where the United Farm Workers is organized, in other places, for the, especially for the undocumented workers, they're still being exploited and taken advantage of, and as we know, even dying as they try to cross the border to come into the United States uh, to work. So, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. But I do want to tell you, because uh, if it would not have been for all of the people like yourselves out there uh, that supported the union, uh, that didn't eat grapes, that didn't eat lettuce, you know, that didn't drink gallo wine, uh, I can assure you that the union never would have survived. But those farm workers that do, that ha have jobs under the union contracts, they do have a decent salary, they have a medical plan that covers the entire family when they get ill, uh, they have job security, uh, which means that uh, when they leave the job after a temporary layoff, they can come back and that job is still going to be there waiting for them, right? 
Uh, these are the, the advantages. And just recently, I was able to take a $55,000 check to a farm worker who retired, who got a pension uh, from the United Farm Workers who went to live in uh, Chihuahua, Mexico. And in addition to that $55,000 check, that worker will get a check until he dies. When he dies, his widow will get half of his pension. And like that worker, there are over uh, 2,200 farm workers right now who get a pension from the United Farm Workers, right, because they work under a union contract. So all of you out there uh, that, you know, boycotted lettuce, uh, boycotted grapes, uh, wa walk the picket lines, uh, give yourselves a hand, okay, because you made that possible for these workers to have. And you know, when we think about uh, organization, I just want to uh, tell the story. A lot of pe some people know the story, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, but we know that we're all trying to make this a better world, and we're all trying to reach out to people to help us. And of course, sometimes we think, oh, the job is too hard, it's, it, and you know, we want to give up. And since uh, we're talking tonight about generations, I do want to talk about uh, one specific person, uh, the person that got Caesar into organizing. He was a man named Fred Ross, un gringo, so to speak, okay? And uh, he had heard about Caesar, uh, you know, that this uh, fellow Cesar Chavez, that he was very serious, uh, that he read, uh, you know, the news part of the newspaper, not just the sports page, right? And uh, so he went to go look for the Cesar Chavez to talk to him about building an organization. Well, when he went to Caesar's house, Caesar hid from him. He told his wife, Helen, uh, go tell this man uh, that I'm not home. He said, you know how these gringos are. Uh, gringos means like an Anglo, right? <laughs> he said, go, you know how these gringos are. They're just going to come over to see how can we have so many kids, uh, how can we eat tortillas and beans, right? He says, I don't want to talk to this man. Uh, so Helen Chavez went to the door. She told Mr. Ross, she said, no, uh, this, Caesar's not here. So Caesar came back a second, I mean, Fred Ross came back a second time looking for Caesar. Again, Caesar told Helen, go tell Mr. Ross that I'm not here. So the third time he came, Helen told, uh, Caesar's wife Helen said to Caesar, I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not going to tell this man that you're not here when you're, you know, you're sitting right here. So Caesar said, I'm not going to make you lie. He went out the back door, you know, <laughs> hid. Uh, and uh, saw Mr. Ross when he went to the door, uh, and uh, again, well, Helen said, no, he's not here. So the fourth time that Mr. Ross came to look for Caesar, this time, uh, you know, Helen told Caesar, ah, you know, you've got to go tell this man. If you don't want to talk to him, you go tell him. I'm not going to, you know, front for you anymore. So Caesar reluctantly went and talked to Mr. Ross and set up a meeting for him. Well, when Mr. Ross came to the meeting, uh, uh, Caesar got all his homies together, you know? Uh, Caesar was a pachuco, um, you know, this, uh, he was a zoot zooter, uh, and all of the guys in the hood, he got them together along with his brother, and he thought, we're going to give this guy a hard time, right? So when Mr. Ross started the meeting, he offered everybody a cigarette. Everybody used to smoke in those days, and nobody would take a cigarette. But as soon as he sat down and started the meeting, the, all of the homies took out their packages of cigarettes, started smoking, blowing the smoke in his face, right? <laughs> Well, once Fred Ross started telling Caesar, look, this is what we can do, we get together. Uh, he was showing him pictures of how they brought in street lights into the, uh, into the barrio, how they brought in uh, sidewalks, uh, they brought in health clinics, how uh, they got uh, a Mexican-American, Edward Ball, elected to the city council of Los Angeles. And then he said, and they sent 14 policemen to prison for beating up uh, Mexican-American kids. So Caesar totally got turned on. He had to go tell some of his homies to go home, right? Because and, and kept the other ones there. But he got so involved that he started setting up meetings for Fred Ross all over San Jose, and they started that uh, community service organization chapter there. And I guess the moral of that story is that when we're out there talking to people and trying to get people involved, don't give up, right? We just have to. What would have happened? Uh, I mean, historically, if uh, if Fred Ross would have given up. If he would have said, well, this guy doesn't want to talk to me, forget him, I'm not going to go back there. You know, the Farm Workers Union never would have been organized. You know, that man, Cesar Chavez, who had all of that talent, who knows what he might have done, but he would not have learned the skills of organizing that he learned from Fred Ross. Uh, so we have a lot uh, to thank him for. Many times when we try to build organization, uh, what we do is we talk to each other. 
You know, instead of going out to talk to the people that need to hear our voices, uh, the people that really need to get organized. And so when, you know, sometimes when we get tired and we feel like we're being rejected, please remember that story about Fred Ross and Cesar Chavez, right? And that'll give you a little inspiration to keep on going, uh, knowing that we need to carry our message, uh, need to carry our message. Uh, there's, uh, in that uh, town where um, John Steinbeck, uh, you know, he wrote The Grapes of Wrath about this little labor camp down there in Kern County called the Sunset Labor Camp. Well, it turned out that Fred Ross, in his younger days, uh, before he started organizing, had been the manager of that labor camp. Woody Guthrie, who was a very famous folk singer, used to come into that labor camp uh, there to sing at that Sunset Labor Camp. Well, recently, this is really funny because we're talking about things that happened so many years ago, and yet they're still kind of happening today. In that little city of Arvin, California, uh, recently the city council uh, voted to name a worker center after me, Dolores Huerta, right? Now, I was gone when all this happened because I've been traveling. Uh, so uh, when I called home, my kids said, hey, mom, there's a lot of stuff been going on over here uh, about, you know, around your name. Uh, so the city council voted to name this worker center. Well, the growers got very upset. And they always submitted a petition to the Arvin City Council said, we don't want this center named after Dolores Huerta. And they said, why? Because she doesn't respect the growers. This is what they said. So they had the city council meeting, the growers all went down there, and then of course the farm workers all went down there. <laughs> uh, uh, so then the mayor, uh, Juan Olivares, uh, he asked uh, one of the growers there, he said, uh, do you live in the city of Arvin? He said, no. Do you contribute to any of the organizations here in Arvin? He said, no. He said, uh, uh, well, you know, how can you bring this petition here so for us not to name this worker center when you don't even live in our community? And then the mayor said, you know, I worked in your fields. You sent us in there to pick grapes after you had put pesticides on the fields and didn't even tell us about it. You didn't give us drinking water uh, to drink. He said, you didn't even give us a toilet. He said, this is the one thing that we got with the United Farm Workers and with Dolores Huerta, so we're gonna name this worker center after her, you know? And that was the end of that argument. <laughs> But it really, uh, it shows uh, what the difference is uh, when we do have, you know, good elections, when we do get good representatives elected, uh, what a difference is that can make in the community. And uh, we recently had another election where we had the head of the Farm Bureau Federation uh, running against a Latina woman. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was able to de defeat him because the farm workers actually went out there, went door to door, and actually got the people uh, out to vote uh, to elect this uh, Latina woman uh, to the state assembly. But if the farm workers hadn't gotten out there uh, and gone door to door, chances are uh, that she would not have gotten elected. Uh, but we have, you know, if we look back at some of the uh, victories that we've had uh, over the past few years, there, you know, there has been progress. It, you know, we kind of look back. Uh, we can see uh, in terms of the civil rights movement, yes, there was some uh, segregation that was ended in the South. Uh, yes, people did get the right to vote. Uh, but we can see that racism still exists in our society, that we still have a lot of separation, right? Uh, if we look at uh, the women's movement, we see that there's been progress made. Uh, we now have uh, women that are elected to office, so we have more gender balance uh, than we used to have before. Uh, so it, you might say that uh, those paths have been taken. You know, they've already been started. And sure, the job isn't finished. Uh, one of the things I want to mention about the women's movement, because a lot of people don't know about this, is uh, I'm also on the board of the Feminist Majority. And this organization was uh, bringing to the attention of the world what was happening with the women in Afghanistan. You know, the women there had to wear these burkas uh, where they totally had to cover their bodies. Uh, they couldn't go out on the street without a male relative. Uh, they couldn't go to schools. They couldn't go to doctors. Uh, they were completely, uh, you might say, almost enslaved in their homes uh, because they couldn't go out of the street. And of course, these were all of the rules that the Taliban uh, had put into force. Well, uh, the feminist majority actually kept the U.S. government from recognizing the Taliban as the official uh, government of, uh, of Afghanistan. Now, had they recognized uh, the Taliban, that would have meant uh, that, when, but basically, uh, what they wanted to do was build this uh, oil pipeline to the Caspian Sea. And if the Taliban would have been recognized as the official government, they would have gotten hundreds of millions of dollars from that pipeline. 
but uh, the uh, feminist majority kept the pressure on the Clinton administration, and so they were able to keep the U.S. from recognizing the Taliban. While we know that uh, things are not like totally where they should be for the women in Afghanistan, but at least some progress has been made. But the reason I want to mention this is, be is simply because uh, sometimes we think that we can't do anything, that we don't have the power, but this really shows you that uh, we do have the power if we just stay on top of it, uh, and, you know, and we keep focused, and, and we keep on our issues. Now, uh, a lot of the work that I have been doing, and again, we have to look back to see where, where we started at, is in terms of getting women elected to office. Uh, in 1990, we went through the state of California, in 1992 actually, to get women to run for office. And uh, we went to, to the different communities, we got the women together, and we said to them, you've got to find somebody to run for the assembly, board of supervisors, etc. And if you don't find someone to run, one of you has to run. And of course, that always put a chill into everybody, right? But as a result of that campaign that we did, uh, we got over 100 women elected to various offices. The largest number of Latinas ever, the largest number of African Americans ever <laughs> elected. And if we look right now at the U.S. Congress, the Democratic, uh, the Democratic co uh, Congress people in Washington right now uh, are gender balanced, okay? We have even numbers of men and women in the Democratic delegation from California, you know? So that is, you know, and then we have Nancy Pelosi now who is actually the leader of the Democrats in the Congress. Uh, I was in Washington for the State of the Union message and I really want to share this with you because sometimes people think, oh, there's no difference between the political parties, right? The Republicans and the Democrats are exactly the same. I was there for the State of the Union message when Bush gave his last State of the Union message. And I was sitting there in, in, in the balcony in the, in the Congress. On this side of the aisle were the Democrats. Okay, what did we have there? You had women, you had people of color, you, you know, you had African Americans, you had Latinos, okay? Uh, you had uh, uh, people who were gay, right? Uh, you know, you had every possible uh, uh, representative that you can have. These were the Democratic side. On this side were the Republicans. And you can imagine what that looked like, right? It was, <laughs> it was almost completely male, you know, uh, very uh, elderly gentlemen that were there. But it was like day and night. I mean, the Democratic side of the, of the, of the aisle there looked like this audience does today, right? Like the face of America. And uh, that makes an incredible amount of difference. And sometimes we think, uh, well, it doesn't make any difference who goes to Congress. How does it affect me? Well, just recently, we finally got back uh, a, a piece of legislation in the U.S. Congress that we had actually uh, this piece of legislation, we had actually changed the law in 1961. You know, that was how many years ago? Almost 40 years ago, right? And the legislation that we, that we had changed was that all people who were U.S. immigrants who had residency in this country could get all the public assistance programs. 1961, we passed that law. That was one of the major pieces of legislation for the community service organization. The Gingrich Congress took that away from us, you know? Uh, and so, just this last week, we finally got back the food stamps for legal immigrants, right? Can you imagine? That, that meant that farm workers who were picking the food could not get food stamps. And this is the kind of power that there is in the Congress. And when we look back and we look about the, uh, the things that we won uh, with uh, the Civil Rights Movement, the things that we won with the Women's Movement, right? Uh, and now we look and say, okay, well, what kind of a, of a movement do, do we need now? You know, what is it that we have to dedicate ourselves to? And I believe that what we have to dedicate ourselves to is a movement for economic justice. Because what we see now, we're in a whole new world. You know, you've got the globalization, you've got, uh, you know, companies that can move, uh, they can move uh, money across borders, right? Uh, they can move all types of jobs against uh, borders. Levi's, by the way, which was one of the companies, clothing companies that still had plants in the United States and in the poor areas like El Paso, Texas, right? Now they are moving their plants overseas. So sometimes when people say, well, what's wrong with the labor movement? How come they're not organizing? Hey, all of the jobs are leaving, right? So many of the jobs have gone overseas. And we all know this, right? When we go buy a garment, what does it say on the back? Made where? Bangladesh, you know, 
gosh knows where, right? Everywhere but home, everywhere but the United States of America, and yet we're the ones that are buying all of these products, right? So we really have to ask ourselves, you know, what is happening uh, to our country when you can have these free trade, when you can have uh, bills like NAFTA? Uh, you go across the border to uh, Juarez, Mexico, and I'm just talking about Juarez specifically, which is where they have all of the maquiladores. I guess there's a, a, a few thousand maquiladores in, in Juarez, Mexico. What is happening to the environment there? You know, the water, uh, the water of the Rio Grande is just being completely depleted. You know, the, the groundwater, there is no way that the water system uh, can support the town of Juarez, Mexico, you know, and El Paso, Texas, and then all of those maquiladoras that they're building. It's an, gonna be an environmental disaster. What's happening to the people in Mexico that work on all of these sweatshops? Are these people actually being helped? Not really. They're earning wages just barely to subsist, but they're not really uh, earning wages that they can put money away or that they can be really comfortable. You know, these jobs are going over there, but the people over there aren't, aren't doing very well, and of course the people here are, are also losing jobs. You know, if we look and see what the United States did to Germany uh, and to Japan, after World War II, those countries, because of the war, were devastated. They were ruined. Germany and Japan were ruined. What did we do in the United States? We went into those countries and we gave them what they called the Marshall Plan, right? We gave them money to build their economy. We didn't go in there and put U.S. factories in there like they're doing with the maquiladoras. We actually gave them the money to develop their own economy, and they did. Japan and Germany have very strong economies. Or, well, I guess they're a little tottery right now, but at least uh, Japan is. But the thing is that we didn't go in there and take the profits out. With the sweatshops, they go into Mexico and into uh, Central America, uh, and now even into Chile, I believe. And uh, the, the profits come out of the country. They don't stay in the country. So it's an environmental disaster. One other thing that's happened with, and I think a lot of people know about this, is that with the maquiladoras in Juarez, uh, the, the young women that work in some of these sweatshops, a lot of them have been killed. There's about 400 women that have disappeared. And I'm talking about young women. Some of them are like in their, in their teens. And 400 of these women are, they call uh, this desaparecidas. You know, they, they don't know where they're at. But they know for sure that 270 of them have been raped and murdered. 270 of them. And, and these uh, maquiladoras where they work, these factories, they don't even provide the protection for these young women. So when they get out of work in the middle of the night, they have to you know, walk through the desert and they don't give them the proper protection. And of course, when they asked the chief of police of, of what is Mexico, what was happening, why weren't they doing uh, anything about these young women, they were saying, well, you know, they really bring it on themselves because of the way that they dress, right? Or, or because of the, the places that they go to. Um, so there's really no protection. So basically what's happening is that the Amer and these are American companies are taking no responsibility whatsoever. So I think that we now, uh, what we see uh, this new world that we're going into in our 21st century, we see a rather frightening kind of a world. You know, we see a world where you have corporate domination with no responsibility. We see a world where unions are having a really hard time. We just came from a picket line right now at the Hilton, you know, where the workers, uh, the, the workers, the hotel workers that work at the Hilton are trying to get a union contract. Uh, my understanding is that they've, they've been trying to get that contract for four years right now. So the corporations are not uh, giving them, you know, giving any of, of the money back down to the workers. So it's a very, very frightening kind of a world. Uh, and, we, and we're not going to be able to change this unless we take the example that Caesar gave us and go out there and all of us working together uh, to make these corporations uh, respect the workers. What kind of a world do we have when you have these corporate officers like the Disney, and the Disney's are a good example of this. You have you know, the, the corporate officers of Disney that make millions of dollars, right? And then you've got workers in Haiti in these sweatshops that make all of, all of the Disney products, right? And they're, and they're getting peanuts. Uh, there's been, as you know, a lot of uh, organization on the campuses you know, to try to fight the sweatshops, to ask people not to buy at Gap, right? not to buy at the Banana Republic, uh, and uh, not to buy at some of these places that are making these sweatshop goods. 
there's been um, a lot of organization on the campuses to keep the colleges from buying, uh, uh, you know, to, from having all of these uh, sweatshirts and uh, the things that we uh, use on the campuses uh, from some of these companies uh, that have their workers working on sweatshops. So, uh, you know, this is kind of like the new world. Then, of course, you have uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the TWO, right, uh, the World Organization, Trade World Organization, when you, you have the corporations up here on the top that have their own organization that can tell com uh, countries what to do or what, what not to do. That means if you have an elected government, it really doesn't make any difference uh, because they can uh, decide that they don't want uh, this company, uh, this country to do this or to do that and, and actually uh, invoke penalties. Uh, so we really have to see exactly what's happening in our government. It's come to the point right now where we cannot uh, stand back uh, and, uh, and uh, not know what is going on with our government because everything that is happening uh, is going to affect us on a very personal basis. And you know, it's in some ways, when we talk about generations past, it was a lot harder for people to know what was going on. Today you have emails, right? I know you're not going to get the story from television. You know, you're not going to get the story from television because, unfortunately, a lot of the major media is owned by the very same people, like General Electric, uh, you know, who are out there making uh, uh, corporate profits. Uh, we also know that the money that should be going to our schools is not going to our schools, right? The money that is, should be going to our schools is going where? To prisons, right? It's going to build prisons. Just recently, uh, the governor, our governor, who happen, happens to be a friend of mine, uh, but uh, you know they recently, uh, in the budgets, uh, budgets uh, talks that they're doing now in Sacramento, they're going to increase the salaries of the prison guards. So that means that from high school you can become a prison guard and, and you can earn you know, 50000 60000 a year, maybe even 70000 a year. But if you're a teacher, you have to go four years to college, right? Uh, to be able to get your teaching credential, and maybe you're going to make 30000 or 40000 at the most, right? So things are kind of upside down, right, and topsy-turvy, and we've got to start changing that around. Uh, I was at a rally for the community college budget. Community colleges are so important because this is where working class kids go. Working class kids go to community colleges. I went to a community college. This is where I graduated from. My son, uh, Fidel, who was a doctor, he went to a community college before he went on uh, you know, to, get, uh, to get his graduate degree uh, and become a doctor. So when the, when the money for community colleges is cut, who does it affect? It affects working people, right? Uh, so you know, we've got to do a lot of work within the next few weeks. Uh, I'm really going to encourage everybody, do a letter writing party you know, at your school, the Mechistas over here. All, all of you get together. Each one of you can write four or five letters a piece, or even ten letters a piece. Take them out to people, have them sign the letters, and send them to our governor, right? Or send them to your representative, whoever happens to be in Sacramento, and saying, "Don't, you know, don't cut our budgets for community colleges. You know, don't cut our budgets for education. If you need to cut somewhere, cut the prison budget, right? Cut that prison budget. We want our kids." We want our kids to have an education. We don't want our kids to keep having to go to prison, right? We want to get those laws changed. We want to get rid of the three strikes uh, in, along in your route. You know, we want to get more money for rehab, uh, more money for drug treatment. Uh, I really believe that the day uh, we've got, you know, alcoholism is not considered uh, a crime, right? You can be an alcoholic and you're not a criminal, but if you use drugs, then you're a criminal, right? You know, so some of those, we've got to think in terms of making drug addiction uh, a health problem. And, uh, and, you know, kind of work with our kids so that they won't be susceptible. We know that a lot of our children are susceptible uh, to drug addiction, and a lot of that comes from the discrimination in our society. You know, because people become very easy preys uh, to drugs. Our communities are really being preyed upon uh, by drugs. You know, it's kind of interesting that you can't sneak over a Cuban cigar from Cuba, but you can bring in a lot of heroin, right? And you can bring in a lot of marijuana, but don't try to bring in any Cuban cigars, right? Because you'll go to prison, right? So uh, these are kind of the hypocrisies uh, that, that we see in our society. Uh, we've got to do a lot more in, in all of those areas uh, to change that. Uh, one of the things, of course, that we have to constantly fight, and I believe this really, really affects our children, is, uh, of course, racism. I always say that racism is like uh, when you uh, get, 
you know, all of which all of us are people of color, uh, when we get hit by racism, it's like a scar that never goes away. You know, it never heals, you know. It takes a long time to overcome that. And sometimes we can't overcome it. You know, it takes, takes us years to be able to overcome that racism. And yet we see that it's so institutionalized. And of course, when we see that the money isn't coming to our schools, we know that a lot of our schools have a lot of kids that uh, don't speak English. You know, they, they're having problems because they can't uh, teach the kids in English because of Proposition 227. And this, what really amounts to, it's a prison preparation program. When we don't teach our kids, you know, where are they going to go? Where are they going to work, you know? Uh, it, it's, going, it's just a way of eliminating uh, lots of generations, a whole generation of, of our children that cannot speak English. So it's, it's almost like we are creating an apartheid program in our society, an apartheid uh, where poor people and people of color are being left behind. Uh, and we've, we've got to start fighting this. And the, pl the place that we do have to fight it is where they are spending the money. And that's up there in Sacramento, in, in our state legislatures. You know, I always like to tell uh, all of the Latinos when I speak to them, especially Latino kids in the schools, when they tell us to go back where we came from, we have to tell them, hey, we are where we came from, right? Yeah, we are where we came from. <laughs> Because uh, we have to tell them, look, uh, we didn't cross the border, right? The border crossed us, right? <laughs> we are the indigenous peoples of this continent. We were here before the borders. Uh, you know, there's a state in, in Mexico called Michoacan, right? There's a state in the United States called Michigan. That's a coincidence, right? But the people from Michoacan used to go all the way up there to Michigan, right? These were the trade routes uh, that the indigenous peoples had. And this was, of course, way uh, before that border was there. Uh, but we have to e educate people uh, about the indigenous peoples because somehow they think that we are the immigrants, right? And it's kind of the other way around. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we don't, uh, we don't want to practice racism against any, any, any group because all types of racism is bad. Uh, just recently, because of 9-11, uh, I'm sure that many of us Latinos in the room, uh, you know, because we look like Arabs, right? <laughs> We've been especially uh, pinpointed, especially if you happen to ride on an airplane, right? You get pulled over every single time, you know, uh, to do that search number because they think that you, that you might be an Arab. Uh, but one of the things I always like to tell people to fight racism, we have to kind of do it on an individual basis. Uh, I was on an airplane recently, and the person sitting next to me meant an, uh, uh, made an anti-Semitic remark, right, against Jews. And I thought, I'm not going to let this guy get away with that. He was a liberal guy, you know, he had a little ponytail, he had a little laptop. Uh, <laughs> and he made this remark against Jews, and I thought to myself, I'm not going to let him get away with this. So when he sat down, I said, uh, you know, that remark that you made really offended me. And he said, why? He said, because I'm Jewish. <laughs> Of course, he had, <laughs> uh, he had no way of knowing whether I was or not, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, I'm really Catholic, right? <laughs> but he started apologizing right away. You know, my best, my best friends are Jewish, blah, 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 you know? And, uh, and uh, recently, my son, who is, uh, he's uh, my youngest son, Rick, he's a, a rapper. He does hip hop, right? Alternative stuff, not the gangster stuff. Uh, but, but he was walking down the street, and my grandson uh, looks very Asian, you know, muy indio, Asian looking. And there was this other friend started talking against the Koreans and against the Asians. And, and then my, my son said to him, he said, oh, you know, you really hurt Dez. This is my grandson, I call him Dez. You really hurt Dez's feelings. He says, why? He says, because Dez is Japanese, right? <laughs> oh, God, he looked at him, and he kept looking at him, and he said, oh, I, you know, he started giving all of these apologies. I didn't mean it. You know, of course, Dez is uh, Mexican-American, right? <laughs> but the thing is, this is, a, I think, a really good way uh, that we can, you know, stop the racism is when people do make a remark about another race, I don't care whether it's white or whatever, uh, that we stop them in their tracks and say to them, yeah, you know, uh, my uncle's African-American, right, or my grandfather is, and uh, this is a good way. Give them a little bit of shock treatment. Uh, I like to tell people that, or remind people, and I ask people, you know, where did our human race begin? Africa, Africa right? Don't we all kind of know this? We all kind of know that our human race began in Africa. And as our human race traveled across the globe, you know, they went to the Americas, they went to uh, the Middle East, they became a little lighter, right? And then uh, they went further east and they became even lighter, became Asians. 
You know, then they went way up north to those cold climates and they became white, right? <laughs> and, and I know this is really true because, again, my son Fidel, who's a doctor, uh, when he was little, he was really dark. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's been in the clinic so long that he's faded. He's several <laughs> colors lighter than what he used to be. <laughs> But, but we know this is, a, this is such a cancer in our society, and unfortunately, it, it even comes out in our schools. Uh, I was talking about, uh, we have so many Latino children right now uh, in our school system. We don't have enough teachers. I think we, they need something like 250,000 teachers. You know, all of you out there, machistas, all of you, think about being teachers, okay, because you're really needed right now. Uh, but I was, we were at, at one um, a dedication of one of our housing developments, and I'll tell you about that in a second. The National Farm Workers Service Center has built over 8,000 homes. One of these housing developments uh, we dedicated to a young woman named Miriam Robles, who was a, one of these farm worker children who got cancer. And uh, there were some bilingual teachers there at this uh, dedication, and one of the teachers came up to me and said, you, do you know what our principal told us? All of the children in their school uh, are Latinos. She says, our principal told us, don't bother to teach them. They're all going to go to prison anyway. Well, this principal enunciated th what, what he was thinking, right? He actually put it into words. But how many administrators are out there that think exactly the same, you know, that really aren't into teaching our children uh, the way that they should be and that really don't care about our kids? So it's, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of up to us to make sure that our kids get that education that they are is now being denied. Because it, it is, uh, like Caesar used to say sometimes, it's sort of an elimination program uh, to keep our people uh, from getting to those higher positions. That's what Proposition 227 was about. That's what Proposition 209 was about. Uh, my son, who's a, a doctor, my son, who's a lawyer, uh, you know, they went to college on affirmative action. But nobody took my son's medical bar for him. Nobody took my son's uh, legal bar for him. He had to take his own examinations uh, to be able to get there, you know. Uh, so again, this is one of the other areas that, that we really have to have to fight for. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, mention was just to talk about. I mentioned about uh, having women in office. Uh, we've got to fight to get that gender balance. Uh, recently. We had a big dinner for the Cesar Chavez Foundation. There were a lot of corporations that were there that were supporting the foundation. And they, when they put them all up on the stand, guess what? There were no women there. So you say, what's wrong with this picture, right? There's no women there. Why do we need to have women? Well, first of all, women think differently, right? You know, we think differently. Uh, we have a different kind of an energy. And uh, so if we do not have women, they always say uh, they're going to make the wrong decisions, right? And so and all we have to do <laughs> all we have to do is look at our world today uh, and see that there's a lot of wrong decisions that are being made, right? So uh, and I think sometimes too, they don't want women in positions, or people of color for that matter, because you know what? We tell, right? When we see something that is wrong, we tell. Uh, I also believe that we need to have women in the priesthood, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to have women in the priesthood, you know. Uh, sometimes when you say that to Catholics, they get kind of shocked and they say, oh, that can't be, you know, it's been for so long that we've had nothing but men in the priesthood. But there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing in the Bible that says that women can't be priests, right? Uh, the only reason that they started that about having men only is because at one time when the church and the state were one, they were afraid that if men had children, they would inherit the church property, right? They were afraid they would inherit the church property. And so for so many, uh, you know, hundreds of years now, we've been stuck with this idea that only men can be priests. Well, that's ridiculous, right? That is, and recent news really shows that that's true, right? <laughs> that men should have the right, I mean, priests should have the right to marry. Uh, and women also need to be uh, ordained and women need to be priests. Uh, recently, uh, there's a woman here in San Diego. She's a rabbi, right? And she's uh, a part of this uh, uh, interfaith committee now that is helping uh, workers uh, get their union contracts. Uh, so that's a very good example. The Methodists have women. A bishop, the Episcopalians have women priests, you know. So what's wrong with the Catholics? I think it's time that uh, we talk about the future generations. Let's have some women priests in there. We can be done. It can be done, right? We need, we need to make sure that we uh, get that done. Uh, uh, I talked a little, just a, mentioned about the, the fact that the Farm Workers Union has done other things besides the union contracts. We've done a lot of housing. 
Uh, Paul Chavez, Caesar's son, is in charge of the National Farm Workers Service Center, which has built over 8,000 low-income homes for farm workers, right? Uh, these are homes that people can either rent or people can buy. And uh, the reason that we can do this is because the money doesn't go into anybody's pocket. All of the money that is made from these homes uh, goes into a fund uh, to be able to create more homes. And uh, you know, this is what Caesar wanted. He, he really believed uh, very much, he was very much against materialism. Uh, in our society, it's very hard because we have this push that we need to make money, make more money. Everybody wants to be a millionaire, right? Or we think that we can be millionaires. Uh, but when you think about it, how many meals a day can a millionaire eat, right? He can still eat the same three meals a day. And there's nothing wrong with creating wealth. You know, we can have wealth, uh, but we need to think of how that wealth can go to help people. In our pension plan uh, that we have for the farm workers when they get their pension, there's over $100 million, which is a small pension fund, actually, uh, for farm workers. So that wealth is good, but it's not go it didn't go to any of the officers of the union, like myself or Cesar or Arturo Rodriguez. This money is only for the workers for their pensions. So creating wealth is okay, but not thinking in terms of how individually we have to get rich. Uh, because if we really think uh, that we only need enough money to be able to, to, to sustain ourselves, right? To live a comfortable life. But then, because if we get into a lot of debt, we call what somebody mentioned it today, the golden shackles, you know? It's like golden handcuffs. You get yourself so much in debt that you can't do anything. Uh, when Cesar uh, formed the union, he had this idea, uh, like Gandhi, of having ashrams, of people coming together and, uh, you know, dividing their resources among each other. So people worked for $5 a week. I think you might have mentioned that. Uh, people worked for $5 a week and for their subsistence. Uh, Carlos and Linda uh, were two of the people uh, that worked that way. Uh, we also have another brother here uh, that also uh, worked uh, for the Farm Workers Union and only earned like $5 a week. And you say, well, how can people do that? Well, the union paid for their subsistence. And you would be surprised how you can live without money if you don't have it, right? You can really do that. So the thing is that uh, as we go through life, we have to live economically so that we're not so chained that we have to just uh, even sometimes do kind of work that we don't want to do to pay those bills that we have, you know, all these things that we buy. You know, people keep buying and buying and buying, and then they have to get storage spaces, right? <laughs> Uh, so to put the stuff that they can't put in their house, right? And then they have to have yard sales to get rid of the stuff that they don't want anymore. Uh, so it's kind of like a vicious, vicious cycle. So if we can think like in the future, okay, I'm going to earn money, but enough to, you know, to sustain myself, but I want to be free so that I can help people. For all of you that are here that are going to be going to college, you know, as you go into college, think of that diploma. You know, that diploma that you're going to get, Think of that diploma as really going to be a tool that how can I help my community? You know, that's what Cesar's life was about, you know? Uh, the other thing is that if uh, people don't belong to labor unions, you can't have a true democracy because labor unions really make up the middle class. Labor unions is the way that you get the money from the wealthy and you bring it down to the working class people. And if you don't have labor unions, you don't have a true democracy. Every time that there's been a dictatorship in any, in any country, the first thing they do is get rid of the labor unions, right? Whether it was in Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, they get rid of the labor unions. You know, labor, because all that a union is is an organization of workers. That's all that a labor union is. When you think of the employer, uh, say it's a grower, he belongs to the Farm Bureau Federation, who was against toilets in the fields and child, you know, was for child labor. Um, they belong to the Western Grape and Tree Fruit League. They belong to the Allied Growers. Uh, they belong to marketing associations where they pay their dues to these associations. Now, the employers are usually wealthy. They're citizens. They speak the language, English language, you know. They, and yet they, they need to have five or six organizations to function. Okay, workers, farm workers, other workers, they only have one organization, you know, and that's a union, right? And so what all that a union is, is an organization for workers to come together to defend themselves on the job site, to defend themselves in the legislature, to defend themselves in the Congress. So what is wrong with workers having a union? You know, as I said before, we picketed the Hilton Hotel. I'm sure the managers of Hilton belong to all kinds of organizations, you know. 
probably chambers of commerce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but they won't give those workers a union contract. So I want to really beg all of you, please support unions, all right? If you know that workers are out on strike somewhere, they're trying to get a contract, go out there, join them on the picket line. Yeah, don't wait to be invited, okay? Don't wait to be invited. There's a bill now that I just want to mention, and I hope that all of you will help us by writing a letter uh, to Governor Davis and to your representative. Uh, this bill is a bill for first contract arbitration. When the farm workers are really good at winning elections, we have won elections covering over 200,000 farm workers, where workers have voted for the union. Uh, but guess what? The employers won't sign a contract. We have one company right now uh, in Oxnard, California called PickSuite. The workers have been trying to get a contract for 10 years there. And this company, PickSuite, sells their mushrooms to Pizza Hut. Yes. <laughs> to Pizza Hut, right? Uh, so, you know, we're trying to get Pizza Hut to stop buying their mushrooms so these workers can get a contract. But this bill that's introduced in Sacramento right now uh, by uh, Senator John Burton, what this bill would do is when the two parties, the, the union and the employer, don't agree, they can submit their issues or their proposals to a judge, an arbitrator. Then the judge will rule on that contract, right? He will say, this is going to be the contract. He'll decide on the, on the different issues. This way, the workers will always be guaranteed a contract. And the thing is that right now, you can win all these elections, but if you don't have that piece of paper with the signatures on it, it's just smoke. It doesn't mean a thing. The workers have no protections at all. So this is a, a very, very important piece of legislation. You know, if this bill passes, Caesar's dream may come true. Caesar's dream may come true. Caesar's dream of a national union for farm workers. And it's not enough to honor Caesar, uh, you know, to remember what he stood for, the nonviolence, you know, uh, giving a life and service to others because his dream was to have a national union for farm workers. And we can do something to bring that dream about. Just like people, by nodding grapes or lettuce, were able to get those growers to the bargaining table. If we can all write a letter to the governor, to Governor Davis, write a letter to our local uh, assembly person uh, and state senator saying, please pass this bill. The bill's number, by the way, is 1736. But you can remember the name. It's a first contract arbitration bill. First contract arbitration and we can get this bill passed. Farm workers all over the state of California, we're going to have a union. And then we can go on to the other states. We already have a contracts in Florida. We have contracts in the state of Washington, right? Uh, we have a big campaign uh, in the state of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, we have organization going on in Arizona, and we will see uh, that union. I have to tell you that when we had that first conversation about starting um, the farm workers union, uh, when Caesar called me and said, Farm workers are never, have a, never going to have a union unless you and I do it. I started laughing because I thought he was kidding, right? And then he said, no, he said, I'm very serious. He said, but we'll never see a national union in our lifetime because the growers are too rich, they're too powerful, and they're too racist, right? And of course, he was right about that because the growers don't want to see themselves sitting across uh, from, from the farm workers. And, uh, but you know, we, we made it happen before, and we can make it happen again. The union has continued to organize, they're continuing to get contracts, but it's a, at a very slow pace because even, as I said, if we win, the growers still won't sign. So I hope you can give us a hand in that. One other piece of legislation that I don't think we can get till next year, and that is to get legalization for undocumented workers, right? This is something we need to get, we need to get that legalization. But in order to get that, we've got to get some good people elected to the U.S. Congress. Right now, the U.S. Congress is in the hands of a majority of about, uh, I think, six Republicans, six or seven Republicans. So if we can get some Democrats elected, then I think that we can get that, uh, that uh, legalization passed. So we uh, have to continue to work on that because it's not fair that people who are undocumented, who are paying taxes, you know, uh, that they have not, uh, do, that they don't have the right to work here, that they have to work under fear of deportation, and that they continue to be exploited. And we have a little problem here also by, with the Mexican government, by the way, because they and the growers and the employers in the United States want to bring in workers on a contract basis. Bring them in, work them, send them back home, right? 
No social security, no unemployment insurance, no right of immigration. That is wrong. That is slave labor. We don't want slave labor. We want the workers who are already here to have the right to work and to live in the United States. So just remember this. All change comes from the bottom. All change comes from the bottom. If we think, again, of the women's movement, it was women who got together and said, we've got to have the you know, fight for choice, fight for women's rights. If we think of the civil rights movement, it was students like yourselves who went into the South, sat in the lunch counters, you know. Some of them went to jail. A lot of them went to jail. Some of them got beaten. Some of them got killed, right? They made the difference, right? The farm workers movement also started with the farm workers from the bottom, right? All change comes from the bottom. In the farm workers movement, we had, again, five people who were killed. Our first one was a young Jewish woman named Nan Friedman, 19 years old, who was killed in a strike in Florida. Our second one was Najid Daifala, an Arab, who was killed in Lamont, California, by a policeman. Our third martyr was Juan de la Cruz. Then we had Rufino Contreras killed in the Imperial Valley. And our last one was Rene Lopez, a 23-year-old farm worker, excuse me, 21-year-old farm worker, who was killed because he organized his ranch to have a union. After the election, the growers called him over to, um, to talk to him. They put a gun to his temple and, and, and pulled a bullet, killed him just because he organized his ranch to have a union. So there have been a lot of sacrifices, right? But remember, okay, the Vietnam War, who ended the Vietnam War? Who ended the Vietnam War? Yes. Students, right? It was the students, it was people that went out there and marched, okay? So how do we get economic justice in our society? How do we get economic justice in our society? We have to get out there also and start fighting for economic justice. Find out where our money is going. You know, whose money, is, whose money is it? It's our money, right? It's our tax money that's being spent for prisons, that's being, you know, given away to corporations, you know, like the Enrons of the world. Okay, we want our money to come back, right? We want our money to come back for our schools. Uh, we want peace. You know, this is the stuff, stuff that we have to fight for. So we can do it, but we have to remember that we've got the power to make it happen. Don't ever think that you're not important. Just by being there, by being on a march, by being on a on a vigil, you know, by being on a picket line, your body, your presence is important. It will make the difference. And if farm workers can do it, I believe that all of us here can do it also. Okay? So I want to ask you to join me in some vivas and uh, some abajos. Uh, for those of you that are culturally deprived, right? <laughs> Viva means long live. Okay? It's not a paper towel. It's a, <laughs> Viva means long live. <laughs> Viva means long live. Abajo means so what does abajo mean? Down. Down. Things we want to get rid of, okay? Uh, so I'm going to do some vivas, and uh, uh, we'll do some abajos, things we want to get rid of in our society. Now, I'll pretend you're all farm workers, right? And just shout a bit, a bit loud viva. And for the students, I especially want to tell you, when you go to school, you go to college, your voice has to become louder, not softer, right? So shout really, really loud. And then we're going to say, can we do it? Can we? Keep our country, or not even keep it, can we make it a more democratic country, right? Can we make it a democratic society, right? Uh, we have to say, yes, we can, si se puede. One thing I forgot to mention, you know, there was a very famous uh, Spanish philosopher named Jose Ortega y Gasset. Uh, he was a philosopher during the, uh, when they had the Spanish Republic before Franco took over Spain. And he wrote a book called Revolution of the Masses. And he said in, the, in his writings that if you do not have a good education for your citizens, what you have is mob rule, right? We're becoming very close to that because, you know, it's funny how, you know, when Jay Leno does his jaywalk and anybody else watches Jay Leno besides me, you know, <laughs> people always know the commercials, but they don't know history, right? You know, uh, we're kind of coming to that right now when we, we learn all this corporate uh, commercials and whatever, but we don't know what's happening in our society. So we've got to be aware, we've got to be educated. If not, we will deteriorate into, into mob rule, right? Both on the local and on the national level, uh, we will be bullies and have mob rule. So let's do our vivas, our bajos, and say, can we do it? Can we build this democratic society with equality, without racism, without sexism? Uh, we say, yes, we can. Si se puede. And then I'm going to teach you another word. I'm going to teach you a Zulu word. This is a word from South Africa. Remember, we're all one family, right? We all came from Africa. We're all related to Nelson Mandela. How about that? OK, all right, OK. So, and that word is wozani, OK? 
and it means the people are coming together to fight for justice. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, group of people. I want to thank you very much. We're all coming together to fight for justice. And I'll say one, two, three, and then we'll say Wazani. Okay, so I'm going to do it first. I'm going to say the vivas, okay? And uh, you just shout a, a great big old viva, all right? Okay, so the first one will be for justice, what we're all fighting for. And then we want to do one for the mechistas, right? Yeah! yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do one for San Diego, uh, for this university, okay, and then one for Cesar Chavez, and then we'll do the abajos also, okay? All right, uh, so first one. The first one will be for Mecha. ¡Que viva Mecha! ¡Que viva! ¡Que viva los estudiantes de San Diego! ¡Que viva! ¡Que viva la justicia! ¡Que viva! ¡Que viva Cesar Chavez! ¡Que viva! Okay, abajos now. Things we want to get rid of, all right? Down with racism! Abajo! Down with sexism! Abajo! Down with homophobia! Abajo! Down with pesticides! Abajo! Okay, can all of us working together, can we build a society that is democratic, that is equal? What do we say? Si se Okay, all together with an organized hand clap. Let's go. Si se puede, let's go. Si se puede, si se puede. 